Is it back to charging motherfuckers 11 4 and 0? After the way EMI handled jazz, I buried my little rap dream. If I had any pent up resentment or anger, I took it out on the block. We started doing work in Maryland. Once again, we had better prices than most kids in town, but that didn't make things easy. I remember one night, the coldest night in my memory, bar none. We were hustling in front of the place where we were staying, which was stupid. But anyway, it was part of a development with long buildings facing each other at either end of the block. It created a wind tunnel along the pass between the buildings. We set up shop right in the middle of it. You couldn't really hang in the pathways because people really panicked. They didn't want it too hot. So we had to stand in this hole in the wall so we weren't technically in the pathway. And the nights were freezing. I mean, so cold that your nose couldn't even run. And in that bitter cold, folded into the crevices of a project wall, hundreds of miles from home, I sold crack to addicts who were killing themselves, collecting the wrinkled bills they got from God knows where, and making sure they got their rocks to smoke. I stood there thinking, what the fuck am I doing? This was the flip side of the life. Here's what I loved about hustling. Forget the money. It may sound strange, but it was usually a fun way to spend time. It was an adventure. I got to hang out on the block with my crew, talking, cracking jokes. You know how people in the office in office jobs talk about talk at the water cooler? This job was almost all water cooler. But when you weren't having fun, it was hell. Maryland ended badly too. Shootouts in clubs, major police investigations, whole crews arrested. I got out of there just in time. Some of my best friends weren't so lucky. It was tragic. I was making money but winning on the streets. Really winning. It's hard. Nearly impossible. Maybe that's why boxing is almost a religion to hustlers, and the big title fights in Vegas are like pilgrimages. In boxing, you have to impose your will on the situation. You have to make sure the match runs according to your style and rhythm and not get caught up in someone else's game plan. You have to be willing to suffer and to make someone else suffer because only one of you can win. Once you're winning, you can't let up till the bell rings. And once you've won, you have to be gracious and let your opponent accept his defeat without humiliating him, because it's not personal. Boxing is a glorious sport to watch, and boxers are incredible, heroic athletes. But it's also, to be honest, a stupid game to play. Even the winners can end up with crippling brain damage. In a lot of ways, hustling is the same. But you learn something special from playing the most difficult games. The games where winning is close to impossible and losing is catastrophic. You learn how to compete as if your life depended on it. That's the lesson I brought with me to the so-called legitimate world. A little bit of everything. The new improved Russell. When I was moving off the streets and tried to envision what winning looked like, it was Russell Simmons. Russell was a star. The one who created the model for the hip-hop mogul that so many people, Andre Harrell, Puffy, even Suge Knight, went on to follow. People in the record business had always made a lot of money. Not the artists who kept dying broke, but the execs. Still, regular fans had no idea who they were. Russell changed that. His brand as an executive mattered, not just within the industry, but among people in the street. And with Def Jam, he created one of the most powerful brands in the history of American ent entertainment. Russell also made being a CEO seem like a better deal than being an artist. He was living the life like crazy, fucking with models, riding in Bentleys with his sneakers sticking out the window, and never once rapped a single bar. His gift was curating a whole lifestyle, music, fashion, comedy, film, and then selling it. He didn't just create the hip-hop business model, he changed the business style of a whole generation of Americans. The whole vibe of startup companies in Silicon Valley with 25-year-old CEOs wearing shell toes is Russell's Def Jam style filtered through different industries. The business ideal for a whole generation went from growing up and wearing a suit every day to never growing up and wearing sneakers to the boardroom. Even as a teenager, I, I understood what Russell was onto. He discovered a way to work in the, legit, in, le, in the legit world, but to live the dream of the hustler. 
independence, wealth, and success outside of the mainstream's rule. Coming from the life I was coming from, this was a better story than just being a rapper, especially based on what I now knew about how rap rappers got jerked. I first met Russell when Dane, Biggs, and I were negotiating for a label deal for Rockefeller after Reasonable Doubt dropped. I remember sitting across the table from him and Leo Cohen in disbelief that they were that we were negotiating a seven-figure deal with the greatest label in rap history. But I was also feeling a dilemma. I was looking at Russell and thinking, I want to be this nigga, not his artist. In the end, we made a deal with Def Jam that kept us in control of Rockefeller instead of my just signing up as a solo artist. Russell would become a valuable, informal mentor for us. He wasn't a gangster by any stretch, but he put in his time hustling, selling fake cocaine to college kids in the village, that sort of thing. He reminded me of a lot of street dudes I'd known. He had a great memory, kept figures in his head, and was a quick judge of character. He also had tremendous integrity and confidence. He knew that the key to success was believing in the quality of your own product enough to make people do business with you on your terms. He knew that great product was the ultimate advantage in competition. Not how big your office building is or how deep your pockets are or who you know. In the end, it came down to having a great product and the hustle to move it, which was something I learned working the block. Russell was an evangelist for hip hop. He knew the culture's power and was never shy about leveraging it and making sure that it was the people who were creating the culture who got rich off of it. The idea was at the heart of Rockaware, the clothing company we founded. In the late 90s, I was wearing a lot of clothes from Iceberg, the European sportswear designer. After a while, I'd look out into the audience after my concerts and see hundreds of people rocking Iceberg knits. So it became clear to us that we were directly influencing their sale. Dane set up a meeting with Iceberg and we tried to strike an endorsement deal. I don't even think my second album was out. And my first album hadn't exactly set the world on fire in terms of sales. And the executive executives at Iceberg looked at us like we were speaking a foreign language. They offered us free clothes, but we wanted millions and, to use, and the use of their private jet. We walked out of their offices realizing we had to do it ourselves. In the beginning, it was laughable, since we had no idea what we were doing. We had sewing machines up in our office, but not professional ones that can do 12 kinds of stitches. We had the big black ones that the old ladies used. We had people sewing shirts that took three weeks each. We actually thought we were going to make the clothes ourselves in our own little sewing shop. Eventually, we got some advice from Russell and did the necessary research, got some partners, and launched Rockaware properly. Once we committed to the fashion, and fashion industry, we were committed to doing it right. We didn't want a vanity label. We wanted the top slot. I'm lucky that Iceberg didn't give us the bullshit we asked for in the first place, an endorsement contract that would have run out a long time ago, because we might not have ever started a company that's poised to bring in a billion dollars a year in revenue. I'm a hustler, homie. You're a customer, crony. The spirit of the iceberg response was replayed years later with another company. From the first time I rapped the line, You like Dom? Maybe this Cristal will change your life. On my first album, Hip Hop has raised the profile of Cristal. No one denies that. But we were unpaid endorsers of the, of the brand which we thought was okay because it was a two-way street. We used their brand as a signifier of luxury, and they got free advertising and credibility every time we mentioned it. We were tr trading cachet, but they didn't see it that way. A journalist at The Economist asked Fred Frederick Ruzard, Ruzard, the managing director of the company that makes Cristal, do you think your brand is hurt by its association with the bling lifestyle? This was Ruzard's response. That's a good question, but what can we do? We can't forbid people from buying it. He also said that he looked on the association between Cristal and hip-hop with curiosity and serenity. 
The Economist printed the quote under the heading, Unwelcome Attention. That was like a slap in the face. You can argue all you want about Ruzard's statements and try to justify them or whatever, but the tone is clear. When asked about an influential segment of his market, his response was essentially, well, we can't stop them from drinking it. That was it for me. I released a statement saying that I would never drink Cristal or promote it in any way or serve it at my clubs ever again. I felt like this was the bullshit I've been dealing with forever. This kind of offhanded, patronizing disrespect for the culture of hip-hop. Why not just say thank you and keep it moving? You would think the person who runs the company would be most interested in selling his product, not in criticizing or accepting criticisms of the people buying it. The whole situation is probably most interesting for what it says about competition and the way power can shift without people's being aware of it. It's like in chess when you've already set up your end game and your opponent doesn't even realize it. What a lot of people, including obviously the economist, Kristall and Iceberg, think is that rappers define themselves by dropping the names of luxury brands. They can't believe that it might actually work the other way around. Everything that hip-hop touches is transformed by the encounter, especially things like language and brand, which leave themselves open to constant redefinition. With language, rappers have raided the dictionary and written in new entries to every definition. Words with one or two meanings now have 12. The same thing happens with brand. Crystal meant one thing, but hip-hop gave its definition some new entries. The same goes for other brands. Timbaland and Cavassier, Versace and Maybach. We gave those brands a narrative, which is one of the reasons anyone buys anything. to own. Not just a product, but to become part of a story. Cristal, before hip hop, had a nice story attached to it. It was a quality, premium, luxury brand known to connoisseurs, but hip hop gave it a deeper meaning. Suddenly, Cristal didn't just signify the good life, but the good life laced with hip hop's values subversive, self made, audacious, even a little dangerous. The word itself, Cristal, took on a new dimension. It wasn't just a premium champagne anymore. It was a prop in an, in an exciting story, a portal into the whole world. Just by drinking it, we infused their product with our story, an ingredient that they could never bottle on their own. Biggs first put me onto Cristal in the early days of Rockefeller. We were drinking it in the video for In My Lifetime in 1994. We didn't have a record deal yet, but back then we'd show up at clubs in Lexuses and buy bottles of Cristal while most people in the clubs were buying Moet. It was symbolic of our whole game. It was the next shit. It told people that we were elevating our game, not by throwing on a bigger chain, but by showing more refined and even slightly obscure taste. We weren't going to stick to whatever everyone else was drinking or what everyone expected us to drink. We were going to impose our sense of what was hot on the world around us. When people all over started drinking Cristal at clubs, when Cristal became a household name among young consumers, it wasn't because of anything Cristal had done. It was because of what we'd done. If Cristal had understood this dynamic, they never would have been so dismissive. The truth is, we didn't need them to tolerate us with curiosity and serenity. In fact, we didn't need them at all. Is this what success is all about? There's a knee-jerk fear in America that someone, especially someone young and black, is coming to take the, your shit, fuck up your brand, destroy the quality of your life, tarnish the things you love. But in hip-hop, despite all the brand shutouts, shout-outs, the truth is, we don't want your shit. We came out of the generation of black people who finally got the point. No one's going to help us. So we went off, so we went for self, for family, for block, for crew, which sounds selfish. It's one of the criticisms hustlers and rappers both get that we're hyper capitalists, concerned only with the bottom line and enriching ourselves. But it's just a rational response to the reality we faced. No one was going to help us. Not even our fathers stuck around. 
People who looked just like us were gunning for us. Weakness and dependence made you a mark, like a dope fiend. Success could only mean self-sufficiency, being a boss, not a dependent. The competition wasn't about greed, or not just about greed. It was about survival. There are times when it gets exhausting, this focus on constant competition. There are times when it gets boring, especially these days when people use beef as a marketing plan. There's something heroic about the winning boxer standing at the center of the ring, alone with his opponent sprawled at his feet, roaring, what's my name, like Ali. But it's tough never being able to let your guard down. When I described the landscape of hip-hop to Bono that night, a perpetual battlefield with new armies constantly joining in, he just shook his head. It's brutal, but if you step back from it, it's beautiful too. What you're looking at is a culture of people so in love with life that they can't stop fighting for it. People who've seen death up close, literal death, but also the kind of dormancy and stagnation that kills your spirit. They've seen it all around them and they don't want any part of that shit. Not at all. They want to live like they want to live. They want to impose themselves on the world through their art, with their voices. This impulse is what saved us. It's what saved me. I don't scrap with every comer these days. I've got so many people coming at me that I'd never do anything else. I'm not just competing on records, and I'm not just competing with rappers anymore. I look at things a little differently than I used to. The competition isn't always zero-sum, like it was on the streets of Trenton. I've discovered that there really is such a thing as a win-win situation. And sometimes, I'm only competing with myself to be a better artist and businessman, to be a better person with the broader vision. But it's still that old sense of competition that motivates me. I'm still that nigga on the corner seven nights straight trying to get back the money I lost. I'm still the kid who'd fight to be able to walk through a park in Trenton. The MC who'd battle anyone in a project courtyard or back room. This is what the streets have done for us. For me. They've given us our drive. They've made us stronger. Through hip-hop, we found a way to redeem those lessons and use them to change the world.